Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast, brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hello, and thank you for listening to the Dementia Researcher podcast. I'm Adam Smith, and earlier this week, I had the pleasure of hosting a Twitter Spaces discussion with five fantastic healthcare professionals. Over the course of the next hour, you're going to hear the recording from that session. We apologise for the audio quality, which isn't up to our usual podcast standards. Hello, and thank you for joining the Dementia Researcher Spaces discussion. For those who don't know, Dementia Researcher is a UK-based international service to support and inspire early career researchers. So with that in mind, I'm delighted to be joined by five healthcare professionals who are all involved in research in different ways, as the aim of today's session is hopefully to make the case for why clinical research and trials are important and persuade some of you to consider getting involved in research yourself. So today's chat is primarily aimed at clinicians and healthcare professionals. By that, we don't just mean doctors, although admittedly most of our guests are actually doctors. We also mean nurses and psychologists, speech and language therapists, OTs, physios, and all other kinds of healthcare workers. Both those who already work in this, but also students or people who are studying and on the path to that career. Um, But before I set the scene, let's uh, welcome our guests and get them to introduce themselves. We have Dr. Antoinette O'Connor, Dr. Brady McFarlane, Dr. Ross Patterson, Dr. Emma Broom, and Dr. Alex Choi, I think. You're absolutely correct. (laughs) Excellent. Um, Hey, Antoinette, would you like to go first and introduce yourself? Hi, hi everyone. So I'm Antoinette. I'm a neurology trainee, originally um, from Ireland, and uh, moved to the UK uh, to do a PhD and work as a clinical fellow at the University College London. And it was, and I worked mainly in kind of blood biomarkers or pre-symptomatic biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. So I finished off my PhD just just over a year ago now, and I'm now back in mainly clinical clinical work, but still keeping a hand in research and and have returned across the Irish Sea to to Ireland, but still kind of involved with ongoing work at, and research at UCL. Thanks, Antoinette. And um, Brady, why don't you go next? Thanks. So uh, I'm Brady McFarlane. I'm a consultant old age psychiatrist. Uh, I work down in the New Forest um, in my clinical role. So I work in a community mental health team, mainly memory clinics and things like that. Um, But I also work two days a week at um, the Memory Assessment and Research Centre, which uh, runs lots of trials for um, mild cognitive impairment and dementia based in Southampton. and I guess my interest is in commercial research trials and uh, and that sort of thing. Brilliant. Thanks, Brady. And um, Ross, your turn. Hi there. I'm Ross Patterson. I'm a principal research fellow at the Dementia Research Centre, which is part of the Queen Square UCL Institute of Neurology. And I'm also an honorary consultant neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. And I run a specialist cognitive clinic at Darrant Valley Hospital in Kent. Um, my academic interest is in fluid biomarkers and neurodegenerative diseases, and specifically using stable isotopes to measure protein turnover in cells and in humans. So that's a bit of a reach. So you all, I didn't realise you work in Kent and in London as well. I, I do, and I, I usually cycle there, which is a nice <laughs> start, start to the day. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm impressed. I'll, will you be keeping that up as the weather changes now as well? I actually prefer to cycle in the cold weather, so I've I've just had my summer break from cycling. <laughs> like at any true Scot. Um, hey, Emma, you've been on one of our talks before. I, I don't think, maybe not on spaces, though. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Yeah, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm Emma Broom. I'm a research fellow based at the Nottingham Biomedical Research Centre. Um, so I feel like an imposter in two ways, because at the moment I'm based within the hearing theme. Um, so I'm primarily working on research, looking at ways we can support patients when they're first prescribed hearing aids. But my future research will be looking at 
um, people living with coexisting dementia and hearing loss. Um, so the other reason why I'm a poster is because I'm just an academic. I'm not a clinician. So I'm here to eavesdrop and find out um, how we can support um, clinical colleagues to become more involved in research. I work with clinical colleagues at the um, BRC on a day-to-day -day basis as part of a research delivery team. And I'm really keen to involve clinical college in my, uh, colleagues in my research. So, yeah, um, thank you for inviting me. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from all the other panellists. No, not at all. It's great to have you. So I'm, I'm interested because I think last time you, you were working in the arts as well. Did you originally train as an audiologist then or something like that? No. no um so my background is in psychology but I'm just purely an academic so I don't I haven't worked clinically at all um but in all of my postdoc career I've um and in during my PhD I'm have been keen to include academic um, clinical colleagues in our work because they just have a level of insight that I don't have as a as an academic so yeah so so yeah imposter as not a clinician but yeah very keen to to hear more and find out how we can work together um on research both as academics and clinical academics well it's great to have you here thank you for finding time to join us tonight and and last but not least we come to you alex hi everybody hi uh, i'm actually a consultant geriatrician i'm based at university college london and also at st pancras hospital um i actually come to dementia from a slightly different um approach so my interest is by acute illness and delirium um, and uh, my two areas of interest are actually through population epidemiology and also to use of, um, data sciences to um, use prediction algorithms to look at adverse outcomes from acute illnesses, delirium, and then, of course, uh, outcomes such as cognitive impairments and dementia. Brilliant. Um, and, and the connection to delirium is really important. In fact, it's something that's on our list of podcast topics to make sure that we cover. So... Uh, watch this space you might be getting an invite for us to join one of our podcasts soon we'll be well, to do. thank you very much uh, all of you for finding time to join us so anyone listening will realize straight away all of our speakers are uk based so if you're outside of the uk we hope you'll keep listening as the experiences and issues we're discussing are just as important here as they are elsewhere in the world however obviously some of the tips and discussion about how to become involved and some of the resources that we might signpost to will vary uh, in your part of the world. So let's set the scene properly. I hope you'll agree with me when I say that research is important and beneficial to people and patients. Breakthroughs enable earlier diagnosis, more effective treatments, prevention of ill health, better outcomes, and faster returns to everyday life. Our focus is on dementia, but of course this applies to all illnesses. But research is also beneficial to healthcare professionals. And it's often those people who are best placed to develop imaginative solutions for real NHS problems, uh, best placed to improve care and increases their job satisfaction as well. Research is also beneficial to NHS systems. We know that hospitals that are more research active, I'm putting speech marks around that, have a lower mortality rates than those that are not. And this is effective, is not just limited to research participants, the effect rather. Um, the researchers who do this could uh, also be thought of in broadest terms because there are a multitude of ways that they get that badge, the term researcher. At one end of the spectrum, we could be simply talking uh, about being aware of research that's going on and openly talking to patients and staff about that uh, or being involved in uh, and working in the NHS where almost all clinical trials are being done. And leading, uh, supporting delivery of trials is another way to get involved, testing new drugs or delivering new types of interventions. And healthcare professionals of all kinds are involved in that. Uh, or at the other end of the scale, we have clinicians who undertake research training alongside their clinical work or who take a break and return or never return. Um, and that's what we talk, uh, we'll be talking about today, uh, as well as generally how to become involved. And we'll give you some examples of how you could have involved in the different ways, what that looks like, the benefits, challenges, and where they can go for support. I should definitely have read back my introduction before I read it out, because I, I think hopefully that made sense. 
Um, so I'm going to start. Uh, that's enough from me, I think. But I'm going to start by uh, going back to our guests who really know what we're talking about and ask some easy opening questions as to why they became involved in research and or became a clinical academic. Emma, I'm going to come to you first as to why did you get involved in research? You, you said you originally trained in psychology. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, so both of my grandparents um, lived with dementia. So my grandfather was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, I think, in 2002. And um, I helped my mum care for him and, and my grandma, actually. And I remember when he was first diagnosed, he's just his impression was just, well, there's not much hope for me then. And that was kind of it. And I felt like he didn't have any hope. And I think as a family, we felt that research gave us some hope and that was kind of what spurred me on um, on my academic career path. So you, you mentioned that I, my background was in the creative arts. So um, I started running a music group at a mental health facility um, for people living with dementia and mental health um, complaints and just saw the power of music. And that was kind of what took me on my academic career um, to get an Alzheimer's Society funded PhD studentship. Now I've moved um kind of a bit broader so now I'm based at the BRC so I'm working and so we're based um, at Rape Workhouse which is a hospital so we're kind of really embedded um, with clinicians and clinical colleagues as well and I've just found it so helpful for my research and making sure that what we're doing we involve patients a lot but also it's really important to have clinical input so we know like what the challenges are in in their systems of working and how we can um, encourage patients and clinical colleagues to become involved in our work. <clears throat> well, that's a, you make a really good point there, because I think quite often we kind of group people together as kind of care researchers who must work in social care sector or university based and clinical based researchers are in hospitals. And, you know, then you've got the people in the labs in universities. So it, it goes to show that you don't have to be clinical to work in that clinical setting uh, f- to support research delivery stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, as I said, not an imposter here, not a clinician at all, but um, work very closely with clinical colleagues on a daily basis. And um, just from having interaction with them every day, purely on a research delivery um, note, we've been able to get them involved in like literature reviews and setting up their own projects. And we've kind of we're learning from each other. And I just think when we work in that way, it's beneficial for everybody. So, yeah, I'm really curious to hear from others what their experiences are, too. Well, let's go to Ross next, because Ross, I think you you do could wear the badge of clinical academic, you you because you originally qualified as a doctor and now you work academically as well as clinically. Why don't you yeah. t- tell us how you how you came to be in that followed that path? Yeah, sure. So um, that's right. I work as a clinical academic, so I'm seventy percent uh, academic and thirty percent clinical. And, uh, well, how did I get into it? Well, um, well wait, wait a second. That's my next question. I guess I suppose to start with is, is why you got involved in research. In oh, yes. Yeah, so, so why? Well, I guess when I was at medical school and the way that I've always sort of thought about clinical medicine is um, to try and get to the bottom of problems, you know, to try and make a diagnosis where, where possible and try and provide a mechanistic answer to a clinical problem. Um, and in the cognitive clinic, you're aware very quickly that you reach the boundaries of knowledge um, and the boundaries in terms of what you can offer people. So I think in in that situation, it's natural to engage in research and want to do research and try and answer some of these these questions. And I suppose there's also a a personal uh, element as well. Like Emma, my grandmother had Alzheimer's disease and I lived with her in my first year of university. So I think that kind of set the scene early on for, for what I might do. I, I, let's see. I'm, I might be wrong, but I think that what you uh, explained there, I think, is is a common theme that runs through the cl- clinical academic community that I've spoken to. Is this that kind of inspiration that you start working clinically and then want to see issues and want to make things better or, or get involved in research? But let, let's see. Let's come to um, Antoinette next. Why did you get involved as a researcher, Antoinette? Yeah. So I would yeah echo uh, that that concept of I was again work, working clinically in kind of general neurology clinics in Ireland and, and just seeing patients w- with dementia but who were kind of quite far down the road by the time they got a diagnosis and you kind of see the 
importance of kind of early diagnostics and and also you know the the need for better supports and, and treatments and it felt like there's a real gap there and that research would be you know the way to to make progress in in those those areas of kind of unmet needs so that was kind of a, a big driver and then I guess in kind of a back along one of the reasons that I had gone to, to medical school was I used to work as a care assistant in a kind of a, a facility where many people were living with dementia and uh, you know so I could see that kind of unmet need throughout uh throughout even before med school so it was something I was really interested in, in getting involved in from a long time back I guess. Thank you um I'm gonna come to Brady next Brady what what took so you were uh, is research something that you always wanted to be involved in is that something you've done always as a clinician or is, did this come later on? Oh, well, I've always been interested, but um, I didn't go down any traditional academic path. So found myself um, working purely clinically uh, as an old age psychiatrist. I got my first consultant job uh, down here kind of 12 years ago and worked clinically. Um, and gradually over time, over that time, I've just managed to carve out a job that um, combines clinical work with more and more uh, dementia research stuff. So I, I'm not an academic uh, at all, but I, I, I managed to work in dementia trials. So um, as I said, I'm an old age psychiatrist. I spend most of my time, most of my clinical work with memory clinics, uh, offering you know, diagnosis, treatment, support for people with dementia. Um, as I spent more and more time in the job, it, it just seemed a natural progression to get more and more involved in dementia research trials. Um, and I, I loved Ross's phrase about the, the boundaries of what is possible, because I guess he quickly reached that with um, memory clinic work and um, it's so exciting to be able to offer more than um, I guess some of the frustrations that we're able to offer quite limited support um, uh, normally so you know I love being involved with latest science latest breakthroughs latest treatments um, be able to offer loads of great opportunities to my patients uh, but all, but from a more selfish point of view um, it, it leads to a much more satisfying job um, for me, so combining day-to-day -day clinical work with research time. Um, so as you said in your introduction, you know, it really improves job satisfaction, keeps me motivated, keeps me interested every day. And, you know, it's, it's made a real difference to my to my working life. Actually, you've because in my other hat, I've, of course, I was involved in setting up Joint Dementia Research, which is a public service in the UK for people to volunteer to become involved in research. And when we talk to clinicians about why should they should promote that that was overwhelmingly one of the reasons why they do it was because of course at the end of giving somebody this devastating news that they've they've got alzheimer's disease or some other form of dementia the treatment options of course were very limited but being able to sign people to research actually gave them some hope which which um was good when you had limited uh, alternatives uh, so I, I can understand why that was a good motivating factor for you yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Alex, how, how did you end up being a researcher? I think I've got to echo quite a few things that Brady just said, actually. So as a geriatrician, I also didn't come into this in any uh, formal pathway either. Um, and at the same time, I also have to echo that from a personal perspective, um, job satisfaction is fantastic as a clinical academic. Uh, in terms of getting into it in the first place, as a geriatrician, you cannot help but feel the futility sometimes of the limits of what you're able to do in the context of delirium, in the context of dementia. And, you know, the limits of what sometimes we are able to tell patients is, unfortunately, we can help you live with this with very little on the horizon. And that's not really um, a, a great approach in terms of an outlook. Um, so, of course, you know, trying to change something and having a motivation to change something is something I've always wanted to do. The variety of my day-to-day -day work, clinical work, but also having a different dimension to this, whereby I'm able to do something, answer questions, ask questions, the autonomy of actually asking questions which haven't been asked before greatly improves how I view my job on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think, you know, we all have a degree of baseline curiosity, which has led us to find solutions to problems and that's why we are clinicians and scientists in the first place and I think that's um, one of the main reasons I got into it as well. Which is a good counter to this argument because I would imagine that they'll be listening back to this they'll be jobbing NHS clinicians who are saying I'm way too busy to be considering doing this but actually it it adds value not 
takes away it just it improves the experience overall and and our trust were well, your experience were the tr- i'm guessing you work in nhs trust at that time were they supportive as well of that decision did you get the proper help and advice you needed uh i think it's um, there's a variety of outlooks that you can get from nhs trust um i think you know there are arguments to be made um of the clinical value that you can add. I think you're a better clinician sometimes when you are able to just ask that question a little bit beyond what has previously been known. Um, And I would say also conversely, as an academic, um, it's quite important to find the questions in your clinical work to then ask them in your academic world. Um, NHS trusts do need convincing that there is research, which is important, um, but it's how you approach it and how you try and convince them, I think. I, and I guess, as you say, different trusts will have different views. I, I know, I think there are very few trusts in the country that aren't doing some form of dementia research. And of course, we're not just talking about drug trials, but non, uh, you know, non-drug interventions and other things as well, which all happens still within the NHS. Thanks, Alex. So that's helped, I think, give us an idea as to why everybody got involved in research. But let's um, get into this and talk about uh, next, we'll talk about how you all got involved, because you've all had slightly different career paths. So let's let's talk about how you practically went uh, went about this, and and then we'll move on to talking about what your days look like. So so Ross, talk us talk us through how you so you finished medical school. How did you then go on to become a clinical academic? Yeah, well, I guess like many things in my life, it was somewhat unconventional. So um, rather than doing the the PhD in medical school or um, fairly early after um, foundation training, I had done most of my clinical neurology registrar training before I started in any formal academic training. Um, so this is certainly against the conventional pathway. Um, uh, but that's not to say that I wasn't research curious during my uh, clinical training because I did get involved in writing up case series and doing a bit of work with Professor Angela Vincent and um, autoimmune encephalopathies which I enjoyed a lot Um, and then after I was three four years into registrar training I I decided to do a a visiting scholarship to the memory and aging center at UCSF so uh, in San Francisco with Professor Michael Geshwind and they ran this really lovely program um, for visiting scholars where they arranged practical research experience from pathology right through to um, different clinical presentations and clinical trials. So that really fired me up uh, with quite a lot of enthusiasm and led me to do a PhD at, um, at Queen Square at the Dementia Research Centre. Um, and I've remained within um, the research since then and uh, enabled by a, an NIHR uh, clinical lectureship um, which really was very valuable for, for, for staying staying within the field. Um, but doing it this way around, I think it is reasonably unusual, but I think I would recommend it to those who are considering uh, doing research because it's easier, I think, to keep up um, with the field. And rather than going back to do four or five years of registrar training, it means that you can uh, stay in research and um, you don't lose the momentum the same way that you might do if you do your PhD earlier on. And is, is that fairly typical then? I mean, do, do most clinical academics who are come from a medical background, do they wait till registrar level or do they? So I know it's all different. It's changed from when I worked in the NHS. We used to had SHOs and things back then. But is that the time when people come in or do they can they do they do that earlier as well? Yeah, so the, I think there are less entry points now. And certainly with some of the um programs and the academic jobs and the MD PhD opportunities within undergraduate I think a lot of people are under the impression that they have to do their research training much earlier on Um, and lots of people seem to feel that they've missed the boat if they haven't done research or done a PhD by the time they've started their registrar training which um, I just want to emphasize is, is not true at all and really that there are opportunities for academics to declare themselves at any stage in their career even if it's post um uh, CCT. I think you can do a PhD at that stage if you want. I've just actually uh, t- tagged a tweet there at the top of this conversation because, of course, you, you mentioned there that the NIHR was one of your funders. Did they fund your PhD as well? They didn't fund my PhD. No, I was funded by ARUK for my PhD, but they did provide um, 50% academic funding 
post PhD. And the NIHR clinical lectureships really are brilliant. And I'm not just saying this because you work for the NIHR, but you know they are like a, a unique opportunity to be able to study within um, some limits. But you get you get a lot of freedom to to start asking your own research questions and developing your own research niche. And it's allowed me to do a much more ambitious program of research that, that I w wouldn't have been able to do through other funding streams. So um, I, I would uh, definitely encourage people to consider this route. Thanks very much, Ross. Um, I'm going to come to um, Antoinette next. Was, uh, of course, you're a clinical academic as well. How, how did you come to this to this role? How did you find your way in that? Uh, so, yeah, I did medical school and uh, similar to Ross, I'd done you know, a little bit of research, um, nothing extensive during while I was working clinically. So contributed to case series, um, but no kind of dedicated research time, not in a kind of parallel clinical academic path. And I was doing registrar work, but knew I wanted to do research and in particular in the area of, of cognition so that it, I reached out to, to kind of bosses and mentors um, from the clinical world about where they thought would be good good places and, and for advice and they put me in contact with people they'd done research with and, and from that point of view I was able to go over and, and work in the Dementia Research Centre for a year and from there applied for funding from the Alzheimer's Society uh, and got a funded clinical fellowship from there. So that was kind of my uh, avenue um, in. So I, I think it shows the importance of kind of talking to mentors and having mentors who can, can signpost you and, and, you know, put you in contact and network with, with, with established ac academics. And is that something you have to then do really off your own back? I mean, did you, did, was there support? Was there somewhere to go to get that advice? Or did you did you have to go out and look for these funding streams? We should add, of course, the NIHR isn't the only funder of clinical academic uh, work. The, as you mentioned there, Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Research UK also fund uh, these kinds of positions as well. Yeah, so I think there is, you know, there's just uh, an array of different funders and it's just kind of figuring out what you're applicable for and what stage, at, uh, you know, you're at and, and what you also want, want to do. Do you do want to do a, a dedicated, dedicated PhD? But I, I am, um, yeah, it's, it's I found it reasonably evil easy to navigate of, of which things I was applicable for but I, I could have obviously missed things you, you don't know what you miss unless until you told about them afterwards thanks Antoinette um Emma how how did how did you get into this a good question um so my PhD I applied for it was an Alzheimer's Society funded PhD as part of a doctoral training centre um, so it was a collaboration between the University of Worcester and the University of Nottingham. So I was based at Nottingham. Um, so again, because I wasn't working as a clinician and I wasn't kind of following the clinical academic route, I'm um, not sure how relevant my experience would be. But as um, the other panellists were talking, I was just reflecting how at the moment as an academic, I'm supervising BMED size student projects, and um, we've had some other undergraduate students who've been on summer internships who are really interested in becoming involved in research. And um, as an academic, I've put forward some project ideas specifically relating to like dementia and hearing loss, and the uptake has been really good and really positive. So I guess for people at the start of their um, academic career or clinical career as, as medical students, there's opportunities even then to look to become involved in research. So um, I just thought I'd highlight that as a, a different route into research as well. And of course, as I mentioned at the start, we have, uh, of course, clinical psychologists that do work in the NHS, of course, can also apply for NIHR funding and through the doctoral programme, which is the tweet tagged at the top of the conversation and and go on and do a PhD. And I think the there's a lot of flexibility within that that allows you to continue to work clinically um, or negotiate with the trust about how much time you do this. Of course, the more time you dedicate to it, the quicker you do it. Um, or, or um, and then of course you can return to clinical practice we have some great blogs by uh, Dr Emily Oliver at, on our website who was a nurse who left nursing went and did a PhD and then came back um, became the lead dementia nurse at Portsmouth hospitals 
And she's written extensively on our website about her experiences of going off to to do her PhD and then returning to clinical practice and didn't carry on to to become a, a fellow or senior fellow. That the experience she got, she then applied back into her day job. Thank you, Emma. And um, I'm going to come, Alex, you're not always going to be last on my list, I promise. I'll come to you next. Well, I, I actually took a rather circuitous route um, to uh, dementia research, actually. Um, when I was at medical school, my area of interest, having been exposed in my bachelor years to um, a Parkinson's disease, I was actually very much into PD research. But um, actually, as that went on, I went into my specialist training in geriatric medicine. Um, it was through a completely chance encounter at the end of a Dean teaching day when I just had one of those chats at the end with one of the speakers who ended up being my mentor and PhD supervisor in, of all places, the Everyman Cinema in Baker Street, London. And uh, he said, why don't you come and have a look and see um, what this population epidemiology thing looks like? And so I went along and uh, we... Uh, did a bit of work, learned a bit of stats, and I took a one-year UPI um, at that time from the programme. Um, I did a year as a research fellow. I enjoyed it so much that I actually then subsequently went and applied for an outside of society PhD clinical fellowship. Um, and so that's what I did my PhD in. Um, and as things progressed, um, I then got more and more interested um, in beyond traditional statistics. And that's how I then developed an interest into machine learning. Um, the route into all this, of course, was, of course, the uh, delirium and its interactions and the outcomes into dementia. And so there are very many different ways of, I suppose, arriving here. That is, that is fascinating. And it goes to show as well that not everybody who goes on to become a clinical academic um, has to stay uh, in uh, along a certain path. I mean, moving into using machine learning and the the data and epidemiology side is something you might traditionally more associate with public health or or university based researchers. Quite, and I think you know it takes um, you know doing something um, into a certain degree of detail and then realizing its benefits, its limitations, and then actually asking yourself, well, what's the next thing that I can answer this question I really want to answer. And that's how I arrived at um, the kind of more data science part of all of this. And keeping your options open that you can still flex your time for those who really love their clinical work and don't want to go off full time in academia. It's just going to show you don't have to. You can, you can flex the two. Quite. Thank you very much, Alex. Right. Let's let's talk about what your days look like for those that are listening and, and can't really picture exactly what what a day looks like for you. I'm going to come back to Brady because Brady. So Brady, you're um, you're a consultant geriatrician. You were working clinically that way. You're inspired to get involved with research through your patients and colleagues, and now you're involved in the delivery of clinical trials in addition to your your day job. So what what does a a normal day look like for you? Thanks, Adam. Um, I'm an old age psychiatrist rather than geriatrician, but um... sorry, you're right. The, the the others are geriatrician. You're a psychiatrist. <laughs> Apologies. That's all right. Um, so uh, my uh, research days are spent at the Memory Assessment Research Centre in Southampton. We uh, start the day with our morning team meeting. Um, we meet as a research team. We discuss and plan what the day is ahead. So you know what patient visits we've got, etc. So we've got nurses, research assistants, psychologists, study coordinators, doctors, pharmacists, etc. in that meeting. And um, I guess the first bit of the day is spent seeing patients for whatever the study protocol specifies. So uh, these are normally things like safety checks for drug studies, you know, blood tests and physical examinations, that sort of thing. Um, perhaps giving patients medication infusions um, and lots of cognitive testing, as you'd understand from um, dementia studies. Uh, I'll probably meet the study coordinators and check um, how trial participants are getting on, how how they're getting on in each individual trial. I'll spend time with the unit manager on the setup of new trials, um, and that requires a lot of logistical planning. Um, we run a lot of both commercial and grant-fronted trials, so I'll probably spend some time um, with my academic colleagues kind of coordinating um, resources um, and, you know, finding out what kind of things they need. Uh, one of the hardest bits of commercial um 
trials in dementia is it's often really complex to get the right patients into the right study. So uh, a lot of time we spend on screening for trials um, and also the really hard work of um, recruitment. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the work is also in um, meeting clinical colleagues and teams and promoting the benefits of research and what studies we've got on. Um, and, you know, it's very hard for uh, clinicians to, to, to remember exactly what what work is going on. So we spend a lot of time, um, you know, trying to reinforce the benefits of research and, and how they should get involved. And on top of that, then it's a lot of meeting with drug company sponsors and that sort of thing. As well. So, uh, and the colleagues you mentioned there, you, you said like study coordinators, psychologists and nurses and other doctors, are they all like, I mean, I guess some of those will be full time just working on research and others will be like you where they, they mix their time. It is. It, we're, we're slightly unusual in our unit. Is in the, We've got far more dedicated people to the research, just because we've got a slightly different funding model to um, other teams. So we, you know, we've got a lot of people who just work for us. What we'd like to do, what we're trying to do more of, which I actually think is a bit more traditional, is having that, that mixture, because I think that's a great benefit. So it's quite easy for doctors, I think. You know, my time is relatively straightforwardly spent between um, my clinical work and, and the research time. But actually, what we've been modelling and trying to do is get you know, nurses working on the ward or nurses working in community and health, mental health teams to um, be seconded to have some time in, in research. And I think that's a great benefit, both for you know, their input into patients, but also exactly what we talked about before with job satisfaction and, uh, and that sort of thing. And that works with psychologists and pharmacists and all sorts of other people as well. And uh, as you mentioned, recruitment to clinical trials is tricky, isn't it? And so I guess if uh, and we know that people with living with dementia have multiple comorbidities. So I, I guess if everybody in the trust knew all the trials that were going on, it would be quite handy when it came to recruitment because you could then just say, hey, look, um, we think we might have a patient for you uh, uh, to refer to your clinic. And I guess that, is that why you spend so much time talking to colleagues around the trust? Absolutely. And, you know, it sounds like a glib statement, but actually, you know, the whole concept of embedding your research into clinical pathways is actually a really important thing. So we spend a lot of work actually trying to do that. And, you know, getting into a research trial should be a point of a clinical pathway. Um, and so, yeah, we, we spend a lot of time trying to develop those types of things. The NIHR does uh, have databases of all the studies. So if you're listening to this and you work in a trust and you're just a little bit interested as to what research is going on in your organisation, um, the link I'm about to post will give you a bit of a, a place where you can go look and get a sense of that. Thank you, Brady. Um, let's come next to Antoinette. What's, so you're back to practice, though. Have you been able to carry through in your research back to Ireland? Uh, currently, I'm largely clinically based during working hours. Right. So, so let's talk about your days at UCL then before you return. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I won't regale you with tales of clinical work in Ireland. Uh, people will never, never come here to visit again. Um, so, no, I, well, what I liked about research in particular was there wasn't kind of really a typical day. There was a lot of, like, variability from day to day. So, you know, some days which were, you know, your cognitive clinics and, and a lot of just seeing patients, but also telling them about all the research opportunities and then some people going from a clinical visit to to a research visit, which, which is really nice because you've got kind of more dedicated time with them often in research visits. Uh, and then there's, you know, other days which would be less clinically or patient facing where you're doing kind of data collection or data analysis or, or just reading about the literature or writing. So I didn't really, you know, I never really felt like there was a, a typical day during my PhD because there was so much to do for, from day to day. Um, and that's that's one of the great things I think about being a clinical academic is that kind of variability because you get to, you know, you, you stay interested because every day kind of seems a little bit new and, and different. Were you involved in delivery of trials that were happening elsewhere in the hospital as well? Yeah, so I did some rater work for some uh, clinical trials and then some kind of rater work as well for a few observational um, studies. So it was nice to get exposure to the different types of studies and the different types of research participants and, and to see how you know, the differences between clinical kind of drug trials and observational trials, but also just have kind of lots of time with patients and, you know, to get really thorough assessments done and, and to give people the time to be, you know, feel listened to. But sometimes with clinical pressures, you, it can be sometimes a bit challenging. 
And and I'm assuming there's less out of hours activity. Not that I'm trying to suggest we're, we're not trying to lure everybody away from frontline NHS work into research. But I guess there's a little bit more structure around it in in terms of you know what time you start and finish each day, things like that. Yeah, and you you sort of a little bit more ownership of your time as well, um, and it's a little bit more self driven, which is is quite nice. And you can decide, you know, this is the time for that, or and you get to be sort of a little bit more in control of of your own destiny, which is is quite nice. Uh, of course, yeah. So you you because it's all kind of fairly scheduled and planned ahead, you've got that less of that that suddenly being pulled off in a different direction each day. Thank you. Well, I think the next person who's going to be able to talk quite well to this is um, Ross. Let's come to Ross. Well, I, I like Antoinette, one of the things that I love about being a clinical academic is the fact that there isn't a typical day. And I would say that there's maybe a rhythm to the week, which is sort of anchored around clinics um, and maybe a, a rhythm to the, the month, but certainly no, no individual day day is the same and um, I guess the kind of research that I do is maybe a bit different to what Antoinette um, and Brady do so I do uh, some no. kind of basic ba- yeah, basic la- lab research um, which uh, involves um, uh, so cell work and uh, working with mass spectrometers but I also do translate that right through to clinical work and doing clinical trials so they clearly require um, different skills and uh, different time in in, in the hospital. Um, the out of hours side of things, not necessarily true, um, you know, for clinical uh, research studies. If you've got uh, the, the silk studies that I've been doing require overnight visits in the hospital. So I frequently find myself sleeping in, 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 in the hospital. Um, but, you know, that's something that you want to do because you're motivated to do and you've got ownership of the study and you choose to do that, which is a little bit different from doing it from, for, for clinical reasons. And then there's also the opportunity for travel. So I've just come back from a month in America where um, I had a lab visit over there with, with collaborators at uh, WashU. Um, so, again, that's uh, one of the, the great, great perks of being an academic. Actually, you make a good point there because I guess there aren't very many... Um, healthcare professionals that get to go to national or international conferences, whereas def- research is definitely still has that key thing to it, isn't it? You learn a lot from going to conferences, which is a, a key part of the day job. Uh, and then another benefit of getting involved in research. Thank you, yeah. uh, Ross. Um, Emma, what's the day look like for you? Yeah, I have to agree with um, Antoinette how every day is just completely different and um, which I think is just it keeps things really interesting. But I just wanted to highlight some additional things. So a typical day, if there, there's, well, there's no such thing as a typical day, but, you know, it's setting up studies, um, ethics approvals, um, recruiting patients, um, looking at data. So I'm a qualitative researcher, so it could be surveys, interviews, focus groups, workshops. But something I wanted to highlight is there's some, there's some other, like, the bit the stuff that I really really enjoy is like working with patients so recently we've been doing lots of like public engagement so we've been writing blogs with patients we're helping patients um develop like a new way of working where they can like mentor each other as they become involved in um research themselves um, and we're going to write that up for publication in the BMJ and it's just it's it's so they're just it's not the typical stuff that you think that an academic would do and um, so something else that I've really enjoyed is like working with an artist to illustrate findings to kind of um, make our research more accessible to like clinicians and to, to patients as well um, and then presenting that at conferences so I just kind of wanted to highlight some of the other things that you, you maybe don't think of when you think traditional academic career like um, yeah so it, there's so much more so it's just yeah it's, it's very very varied. <clears throat> So that's great. So it can keep your keep your interest and also as well, I guess, um, give you opportunities to do things that you wouldn't normally do. As Alex touched on earlier, hopefully we've got Alex back in with his machine learning. Thank you, Emma. Um, and, and the art thing sounds great. In fact, Emma did a, a wonderful webinar for us uh, probably a year ago now uh, talking about her research and exploring our arts in dementia, which you'll find on our YouTube channel. So do go have a look at that. Alex, what's a day look like for you? I was just going to say, there is, I was talking to myself about how there isn't a typical day, actually. Um, uh, so I try to keep my days very, very separate when they are clinical and when they're academic. So if I'm doing, you know, an acute medical take, I will absolutely make sure I 
just do that. And um, I, I have a very dedicated few days of the week where I only do research. Um, I, I find I personally just concentrate better when I do have very compartmentalized time. In terms of the actual research days, again, there is no typical day. I mean, it could be absolutely anything. You could be in a data collection part of the trial. You could be writing ethics. You could be doing data analysis. It's whichever parts of a specific project that you're on, you'll be doing that bit. So there isn't really a typical research day, I would say. And, and that, of course, does come with the downside, I guess, of writing the occasional grant application, which most academics would not cheer about. Yes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so we, we should be honest in this conversation so it's not all um uh sunshine but uh, i guess that comes with the job and and is incredibly rewarding when you do find that funding because i guess that means you're on the road to independence where again when we when we start to think about different ways to become involved in research of course you could be leading your own research which it sounds like alex you're doing um, Emma, certainly, I think you're leading your own research, uh, whilst also being involved in, in other research that's funded or somebody else is taking the lead on um, as well. A lot of flexibility there. Thank you very much. I'm very conscious of time because I said we keep this to an hour and we've got a ton of questions we haven't even gone through. So rather than aiming this question at anybody specifically, I'm just going to say, what do you see as the rewards the re I mean, I think we've talked actually a little bit about the rewards, but let's be honest and talk a little bit about the challenges then beyond writing grant applications. Is there anybody who'd like to particularly talk about what you what you see as the challenges of getting involved in research? Uh, Brady here, just just to add a quick point, just as a um, as a clinician, just to add to Alex's point, really, is that one of the challenges I find is that compartmentalizing my clinical work and research work. So. Um, you know, occasionally things blur into each other and then it does make days um, particularly challenging when, when you're trying to deal with both both sorts of things. So I think Alex has got absolutely the right um, uh, way of dealing with that and, uh, and I need to be better at that sometimes. Okay, great. Um, so I think it's almost time to, to round up. One last question. Um, what top tips would you each have for somebody who's interested in becoming either a clinical academic or generally involved in research? So a quick top tip, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go in the order the scene says, I'm going to go to Emma first. I just, um, my top tip would be just to go for it and believe that you have so much expertise to contribute to studies. So um, yeah, just have confidence in yourself and that you have something to offer to, to different research collaborators. Great. What about you, Ross? I would say make sure that you get a good mentor um, and that can be either somebody who's in your field. I think the mentorship advice is generally get someone who's outside your field and there is the NIHR, no sorry, the Academy of Medical Sciences have a mentorship program for clinician scientists. Uh, so I would encourage people to, to get somebody who's more senior who can guide you along the way. And there are different ways to reach out. On the Dementia Researcher website, if you go to um, the whatever is the tab on the very top right hand side you'll find a section in there called meet the researchers and we've got profiles on over 400 researchers that have contributed to dementia researcher website from all different fields and they're categorized by the institution they work at and the research field that they work in and uh, the examples of that we've of course tagged to the top of this conversation the bios uh, of all of our speakers for today so you can go and have a look at their bios and we we ask them a little bit about what they research and why they got involved what their tips are there's their playlists as well not that you might want to listen to those uh, but you'll find details on over 400 researchers on the website and i think all of them have twitter accounts and all of them have expressed when they gave us their bios uh, a willingness to be contacted in fact they really like being contacted because it means that somebody's interested in their work so by all means if you're looking for a mentor or have some questions or just looking for some advice find the research field you're interested in go have a look at the bios and get in touch with those people there they're all very receptive to being contacted brady what would be your top tips uh, uh, two, two points first that there's non-traditional um, non-academic roles in, into research so you don't have to you know, there are lots of other routes you can go down to um, maintain an interest in research as a clinician secondly um, your local CRN uh, has a role in, in supporting you um, so for example I've got the role for dementia in Wessex as the specialty lead and it's part of my role to uh, be able to signpost people and to uh, put people in 
touch with mentors and that sort of thing um, in Wessex for budding early career researchers and, and every region will have the equivalent to my role. Um, we're going to get uh, we're going to talk a little bit about resources at the very end but you're absolutely right the the so all of England has clinical research networks and part of their job is not only to support delivery of studies but also to be able to signpost to other parts of the NIHR which can help and of course you've got the NIHR Academy we've got the research design service and all of these are facilities there to help you get involved in research in the different ways which we'll recap on at the the end um let's go to Antoinette yeah I, th I think it's sort of a, a mix between Brady and Ross and I think it, it's you know looking at the resources and the kind of senior support so whether it be through the CRN or other things like the academic or the you know dementia researcher or, or various even people maybe in your own local hospital but having that kind of mentor or senior support that can kind of guide and advise you and also if you are kind of going for a PhD program or that path or joining a lab I think it's always really helpful to talk to not only the leader of the lab but also you know previous PhD students or previous clinical academics who have gone through there and just to you get a, a flavor of what research is going on and whether you like it or it would suit you or not I think it's really important not just to only talk to senior people but also to talk to you know people on a, a similar level to yourself um, when you're when you're going down that path. And I've just um, tagged another tweet at the top of this conversation, which is a webinar we recorded a little while ago with um, Annabelle Long, Anna Volkmer, um, Emily Oliver and Clive Thomas, who all have very different career paths, but work within the NHS who can who talked very eloquently about the different ways they became involved in research as well, um, which were all very easy to replicate. There's also uh, Anna also has written a whole series of blogs for us from she's Anna is a speech and language therapist and she's written for us since she first started applying for her PhD and she's now a senior NIHR fellow. And um, she's written blogs, um, fantastic, very eloquent blogs throughout this last few years, talking about how she's applied and gone through these different stages, in addition to talking about her work as well. So do have a look at those. Uh, Alex, I don't think I came to you on that question, did I? No. Uh, I Can you remember the question? <laughs> I do. I'll keep it short, actually. Um, I'm just going to echo a lot about what um, uh, previous speakers have said. Number one, find yourself a very, very good mentor. That's going to be absolutely important. Number two, I would say do what you love because it then becomes far more a hobby that you're being paid to do than a job. And the third thing I would say is be prepared uh, to deal well with disappointments and have a very, very long reward leash. Sometimes with research, things take a long, long time to come to fruition. And that's just the way it is. But that's OK. That's part of why we do this. OK, so um, let's just recap. If you are a healthcare professional working in the NHS, the, the, the options available to you are at the very basic stage you could go away and have a look on the be part of research NIHR's website or talk to your R&D office in the hospital who will be able to give you an idea as to the types of research going on the trials and types of research going on in your hospital and um, give you an opportunity to to so you can become aware of those and talk to them about your pay uh, with your patients or your clients um, and then, of course, as a healthcare professional or as a trainee, you, you also have the opportunity to go along to your R&D office, I think, or talk to the NIHR about practically getting involved, whether you could give over some of your time to go and do become part of that team that Brady talked about at the start of the conversation and, and get involved in the practical delivery of some of these trials, whether that's administering cognitive tests or... or being the pharmacist that's involved, there's, there's different opportunities there to practically get involved. That doesn't mean you're becoming a, an academic and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to lead your own trials. Although I think, uh, Brady, would you agree? Because I, I know Clive in your trust was brilliant at doing this, which is that's a great gateway to going on to becoming a PI on some of these trials. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, the whole environment there then allows uh, academic flourishing. 
Uh, and then, of course, other options. You can go to Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Research UK, the NIHR, or one of the many other charities that fund clinical academics and consider doing a PhD, which can be done in many different ways. Or you can even do that outside of the UK, either working alongside clinically or leaving your fully leaving your clinical work to to concentrate on your studies and funding is available for that and there's some open and available within the NIHR right now um, uh, and they the, those are the kind of main ways I think and th those are open not just to doctors but of course to physios or T's uh, pharmacists dentists uh, care workers there's also one for local authorities right now within the NIHR so if you work in the local authority uh, there's a PhD opportunities for you to get involved and, and come up with your own research study there as well. OK, Antoinette, before I finish up, uh, when, when we talk about resources, I don't know if you've got any to think to this. Of course, I would argue Dementia Research itself. We have a whole page dedicated to careers called the Careers Festival. And in there are webinars, articles, blogs, links to and it just jobs that become involved in research, lots of stories from individuals um, that talk about the paths they took, um, which will be, I, I hope, helpful to anybody who's interested in getting involved in research. Is there anything that you can, else can, anybody can think of? The ABN Neuro Trainees does a nice little website. It's not on just dementia research, but about like navigating how to become involved in research and kind of tips. So that's a recently enough set up website that I think is quite quite useful if you're starting out and trying to figure out uh, how to get involved in research. But I absolutely agree, the dementia research website is is excellent and a really good resource for collating everything together and, and signposting to other other sites. So you say ABN, is that the Association of British yeah, Neurologists? Yeah, the Association of British Neurologists. They have a sub page on their website for the neurology trainees. And there's a, within that a research page. Um, we can, I can, um, I'll can email it to you afterwards, maybe. Um, that's quite, quite good about just generally getting involved in research. So yeah, the Association of British Neurologists, trainee section and research. Great. I'll be sure to make sure that we, we tag that in the in the show notes as well okay well i think we've given a, a great overview there for uh, to hopefully give you all an idea as to why you might want to become involved in research um, the different ways you can become involved and practically what that might mean in your daylight uh, in your day-to-day -day life and in your work as well and as I said, we'll, we'll tag all the links and resources we've talked about uh, along with this conversation. So you can go and have a look at those on your own time. So that's all we have time for today. Research changes lives, saves lives and improves outcomes. The pandemic has massively increased research awareness and more people than ever have gotten involved in research during the pandemic with over a million people taking part in COVID research. There's uh, funding available and many opportunities to get involved. And this is a, a great time to diversify your career and get involved in dementia research. So do visit dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk or go to nihr.ac.uk to find out more. And um, thank you to our brilliant guests, Dr. Antoinette O'Connor, Dr. Brady McFarlane, Dr. Ross Pass, and Dr. Emma Broom, and Dr. Alex Choi. Give them a follow. Uh, do take a look at the bios as well, which you'll find on our websites. And as I said, um, do have a look in the, the researchers section on our website where you'll find lots of other people that will be have similar backgrounds to you or all happy for you to reach out. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for Adam. Bye. Thanks for having us. Great. Bye, well, thank, you. Bye. thank you all for listening. And do let us know if you're listening on Catch Up and you have any more questions, do post them for us. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll call time on today. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.